Hi, my name is Katie, and this is Katie's Corner in Space. Ever since Worf walked onto the bridge of the Enterprise-D, I've enjoyed getting to know the Klingon civilization and the culture. Now, of course, we had Klingons in the original series, but we only got to know some of them individually. Koloth, Kor, and Kang. And we even got to see them later when they made appearances in Deep Space Nine. But really understanding the culture and knowing who they were didn't come until later. Of course, our first introduction wasn't the best, and later reiterations weren't always seen fondly. So, these are five things Trekkers don't think are Trekky enough for Trek, Klingon edition. Number one, the original series. Basing Klingons on ridiculous stereotypes. Now our first introduction to Klingons was based on outdated stereotypes from Asian cultures, from the Soviet Union, even though they tried to do a mythos for them built like the Vikings, it didn't really come across that way from the haircuts and the thin mustaches to the garb. It was all very well designed to look exactly as stereotypical as you could possibly get on a culture that's supposed to be completely alien to Earth. Not to mention the shoe polish on white actors to give them a darker look. I mean, really? I know it was socially acceptable then and possibly written off as, well, we're making aliens, but there's just, mm, even for the time, that's not right. <laughs> But it wasn't just the look, it was the type of being they were. Their culture was based on brutality. A sinister villainy was attributed to them pretty much any time we saw them. They were the bad guys. And I suppose that in hindsight, if it, they had been played by just men and women of color, that would be something to pick on as well. But it makes me very thankful that later on, as more aliens were introduced, they were so broadly designed that they couldn't be directly attributed to some horrific stereotype that we now know is just beyond wrong. Number two, what's with the foreheads? Now, of course, when the motion picture came out, the budget was expanded enough that the alien looks could be expanded. And that gave Gene the chance to make Klingons what he had truly hoped they would look like from the beginning, or at least closer to it. We got the foreheads, we got the ridges, we got actors who were still wearing darker makeup than they really needed to be, but the look overall was different and people, of course, complained. Why do Klingons suddenly have odd foreheads? What's the deal? I think a lot of fans who heard Gene's ideas out kind of came into the, the fold, but still there's this huge gap when you go back and look at the original series and then look at current series, the movies in between. Klingons are not supposed to look that way and we didn't get any kind of an explanation until Enterprise. In fact, when we thought we get an explanation with trials and tribulations and a little time travel hijinks, even Worf said it's just not something that they discuss. And what's really funny about all that is the others' bafflement that Klingons look like that. And it makes me wonder if history class is not that thorough. They never seen a picture of a Klingon from 100 years ago. It's worth noting that even after Enterprise, when the Kelvin timeline was introduced, a lot of the costuming for the Klingons were kind of a, an explanation. If you recall, they wore helmets to cover any cranial ridges or lack thereof, which some saw as possibly a way that Klingons could still be seen as fierce and yet have this virus that completely changed the look of the Klingon for a time. And number three is going to be the next upgrade of the Klingons, which is, of course, going to be on Discovery. This became a huge problem because not only were the Klingons a completely different look, once again, adding more ridges, more facial construction, more prosthetics of all kinds, making the Klingons that we had gotten used to for the past 40 years were now being upgraded to something very foreign, and there was really no reason for it other than we have new technology and want to upgrade the look. There's upgrading and then there's making it difficult to recognize the, the passions, the emotions that we were used to seeing from our favorite Klingons, not just Worf, but I really enjoyed Martad. He was the quintessential Klingon. I mean, Galron was good too, don't get me wrong, but I really enjoyed how expressive they were. And we really lost that with all the extra prosthetics with the Klingons. But the difficulty in being able to recognize our favorite aliens with so many different upgrades made it a little bit distracting from the storyline of the Klingons, their internal struggles, political and otherwise. Number four, there was no war discovery. 
except there was. Now we all like to play with canon, what is canon, what isn't canon. It's widely understood that anything on film is canon. Anything in books and video games, people trying to fill in the spaces, but not canon. So how could a Klingon war that took place before the original series actually be part of canon? Well, the funny thing is, is that too many of us think that if we haven't seen it before, that it didn't happen. I think people ran into that problem with Enterprise just a little bit. But at the same time, when you introduce an entire war, a year's worth, into a timeline that's already been fairly well established by the fans, then it's really hard to wrap your mind around an entire war that happened between two main entities that we'd never even heard of, it's hard to grasp. Because we hadn't heard of it, it was this big open area for the writers to play with. And not only that, but they made some really important connections from the lore that we do know from Star Trek and connected it in ways that would be easy to absorb as long as you were willing to absorb it. My very favorite one of these is the fact that Sarek was involved. Now we think that Sarek was involved because Michael is Spock's sister and Michael is Spock's sister because that was a great way to get a jumping point off giving us someone to recognize, even if they aren't a main character. Thing is, I think people forget that Sarek is one of the main reasons there was ever a peace alliance between the Federation and the Klingons. Sarek is well known for negotiating the Treaty of Alliance between the Klingons and the Federation. And because of Discovery, we're able to see how his reputation with them builds, or at least part of it. And it's also easy to understand why later he encourages his son to carry on trying to make peace with the Klingons. And number five, copywriting a language. This one's on Paramount. So in 2016, Paramount decided to take a group who were making a fandom video to court. Yeah, the crowdfunded film Prelude to Axonar, they were sued just for using the Klingon language. Among other things, there was quite a long list. However, during the trial, a judge removed some of the things, the Klingon language, warp drive, Vulcans, and logos. It just seems unbelievable to me that any entity would think that they would have ownership over a language someone else made for a completely different project. Yeah, it was Star Trek, and yeah, Paramount has the rights to a lot of things Star Trek right now. However, Mark Okren built the language from the ground up. So for Paramount to sue over ownership of someone else's invention for someone else's project, I feel like that should be up on the, oh my gosh, how un tricky can you be? And just think of all the different places that we see Klingon use. Birthday parties, wedding invitations, Duolingo lets you learn it for free. I can't imagine not having free access to my Klingon dictionary, much less have to worry about any time anybody used it that they're breaking some rule. It's a language. And not only that, a language that was developed for communication, which guess what the judge decided cannot be owned by Paramount. And those were the biggest complaints I found about the Klingons over the years as they've developed. And I like the fact that eventually the creators of Discovery did figure out that we wanted some Klingons with some hair. But although it wasn't the first time we had a Klingon without hair. Forgiving of the differences and the changes, the Klingons will always be one of the most beloved alien races that we have been privileged to get to know in the universe of Star Trek. I hope you enjoyed my video. I did do some extra research and whittled it down so that it wasn't the longest video ever because yeah, I could have talked about this for quite some time. However, since this is not supposed to be a motion picture, I thought I'd try to keep it short just for you guys. If you liked this video, please don't forget to subscribe and like below. And if you'd like to see something interesting, check out this video. I'll see you on Thursday. Bye.